Hi everyone, it's Nick Marzano and this is Local Nation. Today I'm talking with Kevin Ressler. At the age of 33, he ran for mayor of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, starting with the Democratic Spring Primary. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, wait, Lancaster? Setting of the beloved 1985 Harrison Ford thriller Witness? In which Ford hides out in an Amish community to protect a young Amish boy who witnessed a murder in Philadelphia? Setting of the slightly less beloved 1996 movie Kingpin? And the significantly less beloved 1997 Tim Allen movie For Richer or Poorer? No, you're thinking of Lancaster County. I'm talking about the city of Lancaster. The city has its own unique set of circumstances, both as a municipality and a community, and we'll get into those for sure. But our conversation also covers plenty of ground that should sound familiar to anyone who's been paying attention to the national news lately. We'll talk about the strained relationship and conflicting values between the city of Lancaster, which takes on 20% more refugees per capita than the rest of the U.S., and the more conservative outlying areas of Lancaster County. Like a lot of cities these days, Lancaster is also experiencing tension within its borders, as affluent newcomers reinvigorate old areas while also pushing up the cost of living for longtime residents. Finally, Kevin offers an unvarnished account of his experience inside the city's democratic political machine. He'll talk about the rules of the game and how it's actually played. Now, Kevin is many things, a writer, an activist, a Mennonite pastor, and the executive director of Meals on Wheels in Lancaster, where he's spent most of his life. And while Kevin has a genuine interest in political office, talking to him, you quickly get the sense that it's just one part of a broader, holistic strategy for effecting change in his hometown. Kevin has a long game. So with that, let's get into it. Kevin, thanks for joining us on uh, Local Nation to talk a little bit about your experience running for mayor in the city of uh, Lancaster. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Enjoyed your show so far. I'm excited about it. So uh, I guess the first question, Lancaster or Lancaster? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a it's a fair question. There's like 23 different Lancasters worldwide, if you include like England or whatever. And ours is um, the oldest one in, in the United States. Um, and it is Lancaster. Uh, I often joke and say there's a hidden G in there between the N and the C. So you get that Lang aspect and then um, Kister. It's like K-I-S-T-E-R. So Lancaster. So first off, tell us a little bit about Lancaster now that I have the pronunciation down right. How how big is Lancaster? Who lives there? What's the economy like? Yeah. Yeah. So Lancaster, Pennsylvania is the oldest landlocked city in the United States. We were founded in 1730. Uh, carved out of a township that was here. Uh, in the 1960s, because of white flight, they changed the rules for how you could annex territory. So we're now stuck in this about three mile by three mile section. We also, by virtue of being an old city, have the largest contiguous historic district for residences in the country. And so there's minimal opportunities to uh, tear down a part of town and, and put in a new, whether it's shopping center or factory or business or what have you. So the economic development opportunities uh, have begun to tend more towards tourism, which means, you know, low wage jobs, uh, but an owner who makes a lot of money. So you see that income inequality. 30% uh, of Lancaster's population is uh, in poverty as we've had transplants moving in and looking for locations to live, there's not a lot for sale on the more stable economic side of town. And so uh, people have begun to sort of flip houses, buy houses, renovate them. And it's it's been pushing out individuals who, again, um, you know, that 30% poverty line, that's that Orshansky model where you make less than one third of what it costs to be able to afford housing in your area. Um, there are, for a population, there's about 60,000 people in the city. It is growing, uh, has been growing for the last five or six years for the first time in decades. Um, so the population is hovering around 60,000 now. So you have financial stuff downtown, uh, but there's not a lot of uh, sort of commoner jobs, for lack of a better term. So there's like a QVC plant and an urban outfitters plant, and those things are in the surrounding county. Um, and Lancaster County, which people usually think of as the like bucolic Amish, uh, you know, idyllic scenic sites uh that is the county which is outside of the city um and they're not equally incorporated which i know you've covered before how that works uh and so um, the city has control over the city but the county government has control over the county outside of that um and so those 
those uh, countryside views that you know of tend to be radically different in culture and politics from the city. So it's very, very Republican conservative in the county, very, very Democrat liberal in the city. Um, and the whole county is about 600,000, just to give you that scale. The city is about 10% of the population. And as you mentioned before, the municipal boundaries are are set. They're fixed. They're, the annexation would take a, a mutual agreement at this point between Lancaster and the whatever county was touching. There's a couple it, right? different townships. Yeah, there's a couple different townships um, that would be. But yeah, exactly. The, the boundaries are fixed, and both parties would have to agree. And no one's ever going to vote to be annexed by the city because the city's taxes are higher than all of the surrounding townships, in large part because uh, we have the county prison, which doesn't pay taxes. We have the county offices, which don't pay taxes. Uh, roughly 30% of Lancaster City's property is tax exempt due to nonprofit or governmental status. Wow. And so obviously, you know, your your local government, form of local government looks a little different as a, a municipality, as a city, as opposed to the other municipalities, uh, which are townships. So could you give us just a brief overview of uh, what does that structure look like? Lancaster City is a third class city by designation. It's not a moral judgment. It just has to do with different rules that Pennsylvania State has for first class cities like Pittsburgh and, and Philadelphia and third class cities like Lancaster or York or our state capital Harrisburg. And so uh, what that means is that how your city's structured to self-rule has limitations on how you can raise money. So pretty much only can raise money via property taxes and then assessing fees on certain utilities. Uh, so we have a stormwater fee. We have fees for sewage and trash. And in Lancaster City, we have a single hauler system. So the city contracts with one hauler and then you as a taxpayer, a uh, citizen, have to pay the city who then pays that hauler. Now, the people who are the decision makers are mayor and city council. I went to college in Harrisonburg, Virginia, where the mayor is basically a figurehead, has no power. And the city council really has the power. They're the ones who are paid. In Lancaster, it's actually a, what we call a strong mayor system. So the mayor is a full-time job. The mayor has a head of the departments and oversees. They're sort of the chief executor of the city. The city council is supposed to, very important I say supposed to, operate as like a board would in a nonprofit almost, right? So they're the ones who are supposed to actually create the budget. They're the ones who are supposed to create the expectations of the mayor. And then the mayor sees out the vision of the city council. Uh, city council members meet uh, twice a month. Um, they are They have committee meetings and then they have city council. And that whole process is between three and four hours most of the time. Uh, they're paid something like $6,000, $8,000 a year, um, whereas the mayor is paid about $85,000. So you've painted a, a really incredible picture of, of Lancaster here, a city with high poverty, a Democratic city hemmed in by uh, Republican townships. And with all of this, also a city that's appeared in Forbes recently as one of the, the top destinations uh, for... It's just like coolest cities to visit type of thing. So like every year now, right, Al Alton Brown, the celebrity chef guy, like he his, he's keeps saying that his favorite restaurant is Luca. It's this new restaurant that opened in Lancaster. And we also have... So one of the things that makes this really interesting and unique is we resettle more refugees per capita than anywhere else in the country, 20 times the national average. What that's partly done with regards to diversity in our community is... We have two Ethiopian restaurants in a city that's 60,000 people, that in a county that's somewhere like 90% white. We have multiple Vietnamese restaurants because during the Vietnam War, when, when refugees were coming, we were resettling individuals then. Um, you know, we have, so our, you know, we've been called Little Brooklyn and all these interesting monikers because the way that our city is shaping up has this really metropolitan feel in this really interestingly conservative county um but like myself i'm mennonite or, or my roots um on both my tanzanian side my mom's from tanzania and and my american uh white side and and lancaster has a lot of mennonite anabaptist roots and though those groups although oftentimes conservative not always i'm not but oftentimes conservative on issues of of like resettlement and and those types of things have been really progressive and so it's a really interesting community um 
to live in, but also presents significant challenges because the tensions that exist, uh, right? So like everybody here loves to resettle refugees, but you start talking about DACA, you start talking about undocumented migrants who work the farm fields here and make that sustainable. And all of a sudden you start moving into like, this is Trump country. We won't stand for that. Right. And then, so you've got that external tension and you have internal tension, uh, both with, you know, potentially DACA and, and other issues like that. But you also mentioned that it's, it's quickly gentrifying. And I imagine that's that if it's anything like Philly is cause for celebration in some circles, uh, cause the city is growing and cause for a lot of tension in, in other circles because longtime residents are seeing prices increase, uh, and, and feeling pushed out. Um, and so in, in this backdrop, you decided to run in the 2017 Democratic primary. Uh, you were seeking to become the Democratic candidate in the 2017 general election. And it might help to clarify for our listeners outside of Pennsylvania that Pennsylvania holds closed primaries, so which means only registered Democrats can vote for Democrats, only registered Republicans can vote for Republicans, independents. Thank you very much. Wait, wait outside until <laughs> the fall. So... <laughs> You were uh, executive director at Meals on Wheels and, and continued to serve in that capacity. What made you decide to move from organizing and your nonprofit work uh, into a run for political office? What what did, what sort of change did you want to see and why was that office specifically important to making it happen? Uh, so I began, as many individuals do, organizing, advocating, activism, when Donald Trump won the presidency, I started an organization called the Lancaster Action Now Coalition um, to amplify good works already being done, but also to make sure that we are doing things to protect the disenfranchised communities. And so we're very Lancaster focused in that. And so we were doing different activism. I had already been doing activism for years. Um, and I just kept running into these interesting walls of opaqueness within city government. And I was just frustrated. Uh, oftentimes I would talk to my friends and they'd be like, man, why are you so angry all the time about like city government? And I'd be like, well, you don't pay attention. You don't understand Like you're straight up being lied to. The city is continually telling you, hey, over the last 10 years, our average has been to only raise taxes 2%. And I'm like, yeah, but your water bill has been raised 89%. You're, you have this single hauler system that has put out many black businesses who were the haulers at the time and given to Penn Waste out of York. So you're now sending, you're literally shipping money away. I'm watching union contracts with, with the police move from what used to be mandatory city residency to you only had to live in the county surrounding to the most recent one had allowed city police officers to live in any county adjacent to Lancaster, which pretty much means a police officer could live almost in Baltimore um, or almost in Philly uh, out in, 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 you know, Chester County. But it was also not just about sort of I'm angry and I'm going to just sort of be a protester within the houses of power. It was also an understanding. I serve on five boards of organizations right now. And, and I often say we can't do only street activism. We also have to do boardroom activism. We have to imprint the issues that we're concerned about within the halls of power or else they have no staying element. So you can just wait them out, right? One, one week, one month, one year until the activists just get tired or move on to another issue or wait one generation. And nobody even knows what changes have been made. They go and look at the rules and you're back at oppression. And so as I sort of managed to, to look at these various needs of how do you make sustainable change as a community, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking and saying I need to be willing to put myself in that political arena. So I started looking at what it would take to win uh, back four, five years ago. Um, and what I realized was the turnout is really low in Lancaster. And so I realized that even though there would be certain things against me, right, he's a Black Lives Matter activist. Do we really want that in our town? Um, he's, he's young. He's he's inexperienced. He's not been on city council. He's he's whatever those types of questions. Um, I looked at the numbers and I realized that the previous election had been out of um, out of sixteen thousand registered voters. The Republican candidate only lost by four hundred votes, and he was a writing candidate to an incumbent mayor. Uh, so it was about thirty eight hundred to thirty four hundred, and I was like, wow, this is a winnable solution. Uh, but more than that too was to say. 
If I'm going to run, our first goal was to control the narrative by using our media skills, uh, grabbing a bunch of friends and volunteers with with videography skills, with graphic design skills, uh, you know, hit the streets well. And if we could change the conversation, if we could help shape the questions and the debates, that would require whoever won, including myself, to make statements about issues of concern to the community that they could then be held accountable for the next four years. We ended up getting, it was a three-way race. We got second, Deneen Sriracha, who's now mayor, had 47%, I had 30%, and Norman bristol Cologne the first Puerto Rican ever to run uh, in our city had 23% or something like that. Um, and so, so she won, right? She won with less than a majority in a campaign that focused more on my issues than any, anyone else's that required other candidates to change their platforms to address the issues that we kept putting forth of affordable housing, about economic development that's done behind closed doors, that's given exorbitant tax credits that sold properties to the same developers again and again without RFPs, all of a sudden, our now mayor completely had to change her platform from being, I'm a city councilwoman, I'm going to continue doing what the previous mayor did to, it's not going to continue to be a rubber stamp. And so now, today, her having won, what we know is we're able to hold her accountable. And so whereas before I was an activist and an advocate with some level of, of, of notoriety, now I'm a community leader with leverage and with with uh, you know the ability to to hold someone accountable to the words that that they said because we pushed issues. What was the political process, technically speaking? What did you have to do to mount that campaign? Yeah, so the political process was probably the area where I learned the most. I knew a lot of the other stuff, right? Like I knew on paper how things are supposed to work. I knew strategy. I knew uh, ways that, that I have media training and a lot of experience as a nonprofit leader and as an activist. So those things are like, yeah, okay. So I felt really confident. And I've been a Democrat my entire life since I was 18. Uh, I was approached by a, a group of people who I respect, including one of the local e economists, to start a third party to run as mayor. And I said, you know, I've got to give my lifelong party a chance to pick me. So I went through the process. So they, they, you go to the designated person and say, I'm interested. Then they will take your name. And at the set time, they'll send everyone at the same time, uh, certain information. So there's a questionnaire. Um, it's pretty extensive. Uh, there, you have to get a background check. You have to submit your clearances. You have to do all of these types of things, which are really the party just making sure they're not going to be embarrassed. Not all parties do this. Not all counties do this. Our county does it because a couple of years ago, they endorsed a candidate who they hadn't run a background check on and some pretty unsavory stuff came out. So the party has to protect its own reputation. Understandable. Uh, it's important to think about parties as unions, um, I, I've, I've found. Um, and so, you know, we think of them, I think, more egalitarian than they are. Uh, but so I get this questionnaire, I get this background check, I do all these things. Then I have to meet with a group of five individuals who are on the nominating committee. And here's, here's what's really important. At this point, that committee is going to meet with all of the candidates who come forth and fulfill the questionnaire and the background check. If the person is clearly a joke candidate, the committee will still meet with them. They will meet with everyone. Sense of fairness. Great. So I meet with the committee. Deneen meets with the committee. Norman meets with the committee. We're all there in the same night, back to back to back. 30 minutes. They put a clock, straight up put a clock. They have the exact same five questions. Uh, I made sure I had that timed out well. And I answered my last question, boom, right at 30 minutes. I had my own clock set up and was monitoring it. Felt great. At this point, you may have heard in like a newspaper, this happens with judges and politicians, uh, So-and-so was recommended by X political party committee as highly qualified, qualified, poorly qualified, or unqualified. And sometimes they have like an even unfit for office. So the nominating committee goes and puts myself, Deneen, and Norman all as highly qualified. They tell us they were going to suggest to the political committee, the Democratic City Committee, to not do an endorsement, but to have an open endorsement. So what that would mean is all three of us would be told to the community, we're highly qualified. Now you go and listen to them over this next five-month primary season. 
and you vote, and then we'll endorse for the general whoever wins. Um, and boom, democracy. Right, boom, democracy. Right, that's that's how that's that's how it should work. That's how it should work. Instead, again, Deneen had been a city committee person. Deneen was a sitting city council person for the Democratic Party, and she knew everybody. Nothing wrong with that. And Norman and I, again, we're all supposed to be given the same documents, right? So the Monday endorsement meeting where they would vote for open endorsement or for someone you go in there and the mayorals last. So they, so someone tried to make an open endorsement early on. It was one of Norman's supporters and they botched it and everybody was confused, which didn't help. Remember a lot of people in these committees, they're, they're, they're just local people who care about their community, right? No shade at all. These are cash strapped organizations that don't necessarily have the infrastructure to train people on, on, Robert's Rules of Order or whatever. So that person had tried to open endorse the mayoral candidacy at the beginning of the meeting when we were talking about school board. When we got to the mayoral candidacy, nobody brought it up again. Then they go to vote. And they're supposed to vote and then put their ballots into an envelope, which will then be handed to the committee chairperson who will pull it out and count the votes. Right. A secret ballot. Right. Sounds like a secret ballot. Secret ballot. Except they told them that they had to write legibly their first and last name on the bottom of the paper, which is no longer a secret ballot. And there's no point. But they still go through the ruse of having them put it in the envelope. And right as they hand out the ballots, right before they start to vote. Multiple people on the executive committee. As they're saying, you need to put your name on the ballot. Multiple people on the executive committee pull out stickers, Doneen Sirachi for mayor stickers, and put them on their jackets before everyone now votes and puts their name on this paper. Now, here's the important thing for me to emphasize. Obviously, it was about swaying people and pushing them into a position where they felt that they wouldn't have the ability to continue to advance in this committee, at least not as effectively and as well, if they didn't get on board. Now, I don't like that, but I also acknowledge nothing they did was was illegal. Nothing they did was against their own rules. They had changed their bylaws recently in order to do certain aspects that they did that night. That's where our democracy starts getting funky. So, Kevin, if I could if I could stop you there for just a second, what is the cost of not being endorsed by the Democratic City Committee? You know, what's at stake here uh, by by not being endorsed? Right. So who cares? Right. Who cares if you're endorsed? You're not endorsed. If you're the best candidate, you'll come out in the wash in the end. Right. The problem is how you win elections, particularly in local municipalities, is by knocking on doors. So I need to knock on doors in order to win the election. I need to, in order to do that, know who's a Democrat because only Democrats can vote. I need to know who frequently votes. And so you have these these voter lists that you can get from the state that are just literally gobbledygook. It's an RTF file that you have to completely reformat. But there are companies that have software that is expensive that will help you draw down to the specific street and address a street list that says this person has voted in the last four elections. That means both primaries and generals. This person only votes in generals. You can figure it out. This person seems to only vote during presidential elections. So you know you're voting in an off-cycle year. You're not going to waste your time knocking on that person's door, necessarily. Um, You could choose to, but it's not historically going to be the way to win an election. When I didn't get endorsed... I was not allowed access to the voting software that cost the county Democratic Party $16,000 a year. If if it had been an open endorsement, we all would have had it. So now the endorsed candidate has access to this. The other thing is fundraising. The endorsed candidate, uh, in this case, Deneen, was following a retiring mayor. Out of the gates, she got a $27,000 lump sum of cash from the outgoing mayor's you know, previous war chest. The total amount of money I raised for the campaign was $12,000. The other candidate, Norman, raised about $13,000. So before we even started, that pot of money would have been evenly distributed otherwise because it, it, you know, it was his committee money and mayor money. That goes to her. 
And then the last thing is what are called poll sheets and poll watchers. So the day of the election, the party paid people $100 a day to sit at the polls and to hold these sheets of paper that had all the names of all of the endorsed candidates from the Democratic Party. And they handed them out to every single voter as they walked in. They say, take this in with you. This is an example of how you're supposed to vote. And of course, my name's not on there. And Norman's name isn't on there. Even though we were both put forth as highly qualified, equal to the endorsed candidate, right? We aren't on that sheet. So what we did was we created our own endorsement sheet. And we said, these are the candidates we endorse. Some were endorsed by the Democratic Party. Others weren't. But, but I was standing at a polling um, place with you know my mayoral t-shirt on and my stuff. And a woman comes up and I say, hi, are you here to vote in the Democratic primary or the Republican primary? She says, oh, I'm here to vote for the Democratic primary. I say, well, hello, my name's Kevin Ressler. I'm running for mayor on the Democratic side of the ballot. And I, I hope you'll vote for me. Is there anything I can answer for you? I'd love to spend whatever time you need for me to help you understand why I'd like to win your vote. And she says, are you the endorsed candidate? And I say, well, I was put forth as highly qualified. She says, well, I want the endorsement sheet. Are you the endorsed candidate? And I said, I've got an endorsement sheet right here about why I think I can work with these individuals. And the the person who was being paid to sit there goes, I have the endorsement sheet. And she walks right past me. I said, is there anything I can answer you? She goes, no, I just want to know who's endorsed. Takes that sheet, goes in the booth, votes. How do you beat that? It's a machine. Philadelphia can be very similar. We have the same committee person structure across 66 wards. May get into that on the podcast at some point and would love to see how other other cities fare in terms of uh, the their endorsement process. And the closed primary could have a lot to do with that, right? Because you you don't have Republicans or independents voting across. Uh, so it is it is Democrats doing for Democrats and Republicans doing for Republicans. So listeners may hear this, whether they're listeners in Pennsylvania, uh, where we have these closed primaries, or if they have a similar situation in their home municipality, and think, uh, wow, that sounds uh, that sounds pretty bleak. What advice would you give to someone out there uh, thinking about running? What, I mean, was it was it worthwhile? Right. So number one, remember, control the narrative. So we've controlled the narrative that gives us power moving forward. So was it worth it? Yeah, for that alone. Number two, what do you do? Well, you can either do it beforehand or you can do it like we've done afterwards, which is begin to convince young, uh, doesn't have to be young, uh, convince people who share a political ideology with you to be a committee person. Committee people are either appointed, generally, in, in, in our situation they are, or they can run. All they need is 10 petition signatures to get on the ballot. But the other thing is run, run hard, and, and know that surprises can happen. We are coming out of, right, especially on the Democratic side. The Republicans do it. They do it slightly differently. Their structure is different. But, you know, we've had this history of idolizing, while pretending we don't like it, but idolizing the Chicago machine. And every town, I think, in America that has a Democratic committee has tried to emulate what they do in Chicago. It's about maintaining power. Everything at the end of the day, and this is right, this is like all of our issues, whether it's racism, sexism, um, whether it's politics or whatever, is about power. And it's about maintaining power if you have it. And what we're seeing right now is the disruption of power by those who have realized how they have been complicit in systems that have taken advantage of them. You can make changes by showing up. It's amazing how significant your changes can be. It doesn't have to be politics, but it can be. But what it consistently is, wherever the arena, is it's controlling the narrative. And the way you control the narrative is by making sure you understand what's at stake you understand the way the game is going to be played as best as you can. And then you find a way to be more virtuous, to be more hardworking and diligent, and to outsmart your competition. And, it, and, and then that's how we win. Thanks one more time to Kevin Ressler for taking the time to talk with me. You should check out his blog at kevinmichaelwrestler.com or connect with him through the Lancaster Action Now Facebook page. I'll place both those links in the show notes at localnationpodcast.com. 
And you can follow me on Twitter at Local Nation Show, like the show on Facebook at Local Nation Podcast. And if you're in the market for a huge shot of karma, please leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. In the meantime, thanks for listening and for being an above average citizen.